Hello and welcome back to the study or the talk or me reading about the Satipatthana Vipassana. Continuing on and I think we should do an intro and maybe we shouldn't forget to do the outro as well. So Namo Buddhasa, homage to the fully enlightened one. I'm going to read, um, continuing on, as we were looking at the words of the Buddha from the Dhammapada, verse 37. Um, and the verse goes as follows. Faring far, wandering alone, formless, and lying in a cave, those who do restrain the mind are sure released from Mara's bond. And so we're going to be continuing into um, this explanation of what the Buddha actually meant when uh, giving that verse. And so, continuing on here. Formless. Mind has no substance, no form. It is not easy to distinguish as it is the case with materiality. It is not okay. In the case of materiality, or the body, head, hands, and legs are very prominent and are easily noticed. If it is asked, what matter is? Um, matter can be handled and shown. Mind, however, is not easy to describe because it has no substance or form. And for this reason, it is not possible to carry out analytical labor laboratory experiments on the mind. One can, however, fully understand the mind if it is, if it is explained as that which knows an object. To understand the mind, it is necessary to contemplate the mind at every moment of its occurrence. When contemplation is fairly advanced, the mind's approach to its object is clearly comprehended. It appears as if each moment of mind is making a direct leap towards it, its object in order to know the true nature of the mind. Contemplation is thus prescribed. Lying in a cave. Because the mind comes into being depending on the mind base and the other sense doors situated in the body, it is said that it rests in a cave. Those who do restrain the mind are sure released from Mara's bonds. It is said that the mind should be contemplated at each moment of its occurrence. The mind can thus be controlled by means of contemplation. On, on his successful controlling of the mind, the yogi will win freedom from bondage of from the bondage of Mara. The king of death. It will now be seen that it is important to note the mind at every moment of its occurrence. As soon as it is noted, the mind passes away. For instance, by noting once or twice as intending, intending, it is found that intention passes away at once. The usual exercise of noting as rising, falling, rising, and falling should be reverted to. While one is, while one is proceeding with the usual exercise, one may feel that one wants to swallow saliva. It should be noted as wanting, 
and on gathering saliva as gathering and on swallowing as swallowing. In the serial order of occurrence, the reason for contemplation in this case is because there may be a, per a persisting personal view as wanting to swallow is I. Swallowing is also I. In reality, wanting to swallow is mentality and not I, and swallowing is materiality and not I. There exists only mentality and materiality at that moment. By means of contemplating in this manner, one will understand clearly the process of reality. So too, in the case of spitting, it should be noted as spitting. Oh, I'm sorry, I read the wrong part. By means of contemplating in this manner, one will understand clearly the process of reality. And so too, in the case of spitting, it should be noted as wanting when one wants to spit. As bending on bending the neck, which should be done slowly. As looking, seeing, on looking, and as spitting, on spitting. So this is kind of a spitting meditation. Afterwards, the usual exercise of noting rising and falling should be continued. Because of sitting for a long time, there will arise in the body unpleasant feeling of being stiff, being hot, and so forth. These sensations be should be noted as they occur. The mind should be fixed on that spot and note made as and a note made as stiff, stiff, on feeling stiff, as hot, hot, on feeling hot, as painful, painful, on feeling painful, as prickly, prickly, on feeling prickly sensations, and as tired, tired, on feeling tired. These unpleasant feelings are Dukkha Vedana, and the contemplation of these is Vedana Nupasana, contemplation on feeling. Owing to the absence of knowledge in respect to these feelings, there persists the wrong view of holding them as one's own personality or self. That is to say, I am feeling stiff. I am feeling painful. I was feeling well formerly, but now I feel uncomfortable. In the manner of a single self. In reality... In reality, unpleasant feelings arise owing to disagreeable impressions in the body. Like the light of an electric bulb which can continue to burn on a continuous supply of energy, so it is the case of feelings which arise anew on every occasion of coming into contact with disagreeable impressions. So actually, if you record a light bulb, like the one that's here, and put it in slow motion, you'll see that it is not continuous, it's just flashing so fast, like the light on my hand right here, right? If I hold here, you, you can see there's light on my hand. So if we put this, you can probably do this, if you're low, 
put this in like a slow motion or like half speed. I don't know if it actually affects the camera correctly, but you should see or you can see like if you record something in slow motion, the light is actually flickering on and off, but it is going so fast that the my the eyes cannot see it. Sometimes if you are looking at a light pole outside at night, you can see it kind of flickers. And that it might be because it is an older uh, light pole or you know, <laughs> so um, light is not actually uh, on at all times. I just thought that would be interesting to consider talking about light bulbs. Electric light bulbs. So yeah, they are kind of like the mind as well, you know. And they're just so fast that we cannot see that it actually switches off. But it's not on all the time. And so that's how a light bulb works. Just to, you know, kind of put that into perspective. Okay, it is essential to understand these feelings clearly. At the beginning of noting a stiff, stiff, hot, hot, painful, painful. One may feel that such disagreeable feelings grow stronger and then one will notice uh, that a mind wanting to change the posture arises. This mind should be noted as wanting, wanting, then a return should be made to the then a return should be made to the feeling and it should be noted as stiff stiff or hot hot and so forth one if one proceeds in this manner of contemplation with great patience unpleasant feelings will pass away there is a saying that patience leads to Nibbana. Evidently, this saying is more applicable in the case of contemplation than in any other. Plenty of patience is needed in contemplation. If a meditator cannot bear unpleasant feelings with patience, but frequently changes his posture during contemplation, he cannot expect to gain concentration. Without concentration, there is no chance of acquiring insight knowledge, vipassana jnana. And without insight knowledge, the attainment of the path, fruition and nibbana cannot be won. Patience is of great importance in contemplation. Patience is needed mostly to bear unpleasant bodily feelings. Uh, there is hardly any case of outside disturbances where it is unnecessary to exercise patience. This means the observance of kanti samvara, restraint by patience. The posture should not be immediately changed when unpleasant sensations arise, but contemplation should be continued by noting them as stiff, stiff or hot, hot, and so on. Such painful sensations are normal and will pass away. In the case of strong concentration, it will be found that great pains will pass away when they are noted with patience. On the fading away of suffering or pain, the usual exercise of noting rising, falling, should be continued. On the other hand, it may be, it may be found that the pains or unpleasant feelings do not immediately pass away, even when one notes them with great patience. And so, 
Okay. So low battery. In such case, one has no alternative but to change posture. One must, of course, submit to superior forces when concentration is not strong enough. Strong pains will not pass away quickly. In these circumstances, there will often arise a mind wanting to change posture. And this mind should be noted as wanting, wanting. After this, one should note lifting, lifting on moving it forward. So if you move, note that as well. Really hope I can get through, but I don't think I can. I'm not on this battery. And so we're just going to have to see how far we get. These bodily actions should be carried out slowly. And these slow movements should be followed up and noted as lifting, lifting, moving, moving, touching, touching, in the successive order of the process. Again, on moving, one should note moving, moving, and on putting down, note putting, putting. If, when this process of changing posture has been completed, there is nothing more to be noted. The usual exercise of noting, rising and falling should be continued. There should be no stop or break in between. The preceding act of noting and the one which follows should be continu contiguous. Similarly, the preceding concentration and the one which follows should be contiguous. And the preceding act of knowing and the one which follows should be contiguous. In this way, the gradual development by stages of mindfulness, concentration and knowledge takes place. And depending on their full development, the final stage of path knowledge is attained. In the practice of vipassana meditation, it is important to follow the example of a person who tries to make a fire. To make a fire in the days before matches, a person had to constantly rub two sticks together without the slightest break in motion. As the sticks became hotter and hotter, more effort was needed, and the, the rubbing had to be carried out incessantly. Only when the fire had been produced was the person at liberty to take a rest. Similarly, a meditator should work hard so that there is no break between the preceding noting and the one which follows, and the, pre and the preceding concentration and the one which follows. He should revert to his usual exercise of noting rising and falling after he has noted painful sensations. While being thus occupied with his usual exercise, he may again feel itching sensations somewhere in the body. He should then fix his mind on this spot and make a note as itching, itching. Itching is an unpleasant sensation. As soon as it is felt, there arises a mind which wants to rub or scratch. This mind should be noted as wanting, wanting, after which no rubbing or scratching must be done as yet, but a return should be made to the itching and a note made as itching, itching. While one is occupied with the contemplation in this manner, itching in most cases passes away and the usual exercise of noting rising and falling should be reverted to. So I'm going to pause this recording and then I'm going to put some cable into the phone. And so we're going to continue so I don't get cut off. Um, by losing 
the charge on the battery. What am I saying? Just a second. Okay, so I got... Uh, I did the thing with the battery so <laughs> it won't run out. And so I can read. I can read. Okay. So, if on the other hand it is found that itching does not pass away, but that it is necessary to rub or scratch, the contemplation of the success successive stages should be carried out by noting the mind is wanting, wanting. It should then be continued by noting raising, raising, on raising the hand, touching, touching, when the hand touches the spot, rubbing, rubbing, or scratching, scratching. When the hand rubs or scratches, withdrawing, withdrawing, on withdrawing the hand, touching, touching, when the hand touches the body. And then the usual contemplation of rising and falling should be continued. In every case of changing postures, contemplation of the successive stages should be carried out. Uh, similarly and carefully. While thus carefully proceeding with the contemplation, one might find that painful feelings or unpleasant sen sensations arise in the body of their own accord. Ordinarily, people change their posture as soon as they feel even the slightest unpleasant sensation of tiredness or heat without taking heed of these incidents. The change of posture is carried out quite heedlessly, just while the seed of pain is beginning to grow. Thus, painful feelings fail to take place in a distinctive manner. And for this reason, it is said that as a rule, the postures hide painful feelings from view. People generally think that they that they are feeling well for days and nights on end. They think that painful feelings occur only at the time of an attack or a dangerous disease. Reality is just the opposite of what people think. Let anyone try to see how long he can keep himself in a sitting posture without moving or changing. One will find it uncomfortable after a short while, say five or ten minutes. And then one will begin to find it unbearable after fifteen or twenty minutes. Only will then be... Oh, I read... Let me try that again. One will then be compelled to move over. One will then be compelled to move or change one's posture by either raising or lower, lowering the head, moving the hands or legs, or by swaying the body either forward or backward. Many movements usually take place during a short time and the number would be very large if they were to be counted for the length of just one day. However, no one appears to be aware of this fact because no one takes heed. Such is the order in every case. Such is the order in every case, while in the case of a yogi who is always mindful to his actions, who is proceeding with contemplation, body 
impressions in their own respective nature are therefore distinctly noticed. They cannot help but reveal themselves fully in or fully in their own nature because he is watching until they come into full view. Though a painful sensation arises, he keeps on noting it. He does not ordinary he does not ordinarily attempt to change his posture or move. Then on the arising of the mind Then on the arising of mind wanting to change, he at once makes a note of it as wanting, wanting, and afterwards he returns again to the painful sensation and continues his noting of it. He changes his posture or moves only when he finds the painful feeling unbearable. In this case, he also begins by noting the wanting mind and proceeds with noting carefully each stage in the process of moving. This is why the postures can no longer hide painful sensations. Often a yogi or a meditator finds painful sensations creeping from here and there, or he may feel hot sensations, aching sensations, itching sensations, or the whole body is a mass of painful sensations. That is how painful sensations are found to be predominant, because the postures cannot cover them. If he intends to change his posture from sitting to standing, he should first make a note of the intending mind as intending, intending, and proceed with the arranging of the hands and legs in the successive stages by noting as ri rising, raising, moving, stretching, touching, pressing, and so forth. When the body sways forward, it should be noted as swaying, swaying, while in the course of standing up there occurs in the body a feeling of lightness as well as the act of rising. Attention should be fixed on these factors and a note made as rising, rising. The act of rising should be carried out slowly. During the course of practice, it is most appropriate if the meditator acts feebly, acts feebly and slowly in all activities, just like a weak, sick person. Perhaps the case of a person suffering from lumbago would be a more fitting example here. The patient must always be cautious and move slowly just to avoid pains. In the same manner, a meditator should always try to keep to slow movements in all actions. Slow motion is necessary to enable mindfulness, concentration and knowledge to catch up. One has lived, one has lived all the time in a careless manner and one just begins seriously to train oneself in keeping the mind within the body. It is only the beginning and one's mindfulness, concentration and knowledge have not yet been probably geared up while the physical and mental processes are moving at top speed. Thus, it is thus imperative to bring the top level speed of these processes to the lowest gear so as to make it possible for mindfulness and knowledge to keep pace with them. It is therefore desirable that slow motions that slow motion exercises be carried out at all times and further it is advisable for a meditator to behave like a blind person throughout the course of training a person without any restraint will look 
will not look dignified because he usually looks at things and persons wantonly. He also cannot obtain a steady and calm state of mind. The blind person, on the other hand, behaves in a composed manner by sitting sedatedly with downcast eyes. He never turns in any direction to look at things or persons because he is blind and cannot see them. Even if a person comes near him and speaks to him, he never turns around or looks at that person. This composed manner is worthy of imitation. A meditator should act in the same manner while carrying out the practice of contemplation. He should not look anywhere. The mind should be solely intent on the object of contemplation. While in the sitting posture, he must be intently uh, noting rising, falling. Even if strange things occur nearby, he should not no uh, look at them. He must simply make a note a seeing, seeing, and then continue with the usual exercise of noting rising and falling. A yogi or meditator should have a high regard for this exercise and carry it out with due respect, so much so as to be mistaken for a blind person. In this respect, certain uh, female yogi, certain girl yogis were found to be in perfect form. They carefully carried out the exercise with all due respect in accordance with the instructions. Their manner was very composed and they were always intent on the objects of contemplation. They never looked around. When they walked, they were always intent on the steps. Their steps were light, smooth and slow. Every meditator should follow their example. It is necessary for a meditator to behave like a deaf person also. Ordinarily, as soon as a person hears the sound, he turns around and looks in the same direction from which the sound came, or he turns towards the uh, person who spoke to him and makes a reply. He does not behave in a sedate manner. A deaf person, on the other hand, behaves in a composed manner. He does not take heed of any sound or talk because he never hears them. Similarly, a meditator should conduct himself in a manner without taking heed to any unimportant talk, nor should he deliberately listen to any talk or speech. If he happens to hear any sound or speech, he should at once make a note as hearing, hearing and then return to the usual practice of noting rising and falling. He should be preceded. He should proceed with his contempla contemplation intently, so much so as to be mistaken for a deaf person. It should be this. We're going to end this off here. There's just one last line here. I don't think I'm going to make it. 30 seconds. It should be remembered that the only concern of a meditator is carrying out intently of contemplation. Other things seen or heard are not his concern. Even though they may appear to be strange or interesting, he should not t uh, take heed of them.